Hello. Oh, well, okay. Now you see a dark Pablo. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to continue with the Dutch Spring School. Um, I, I should say that uh, the session is going to be broadcasted, so be careful what you do from your chairs. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's early in the morning. Uh, we, we are continuing from, 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 from yesterday, so, so as... Uh, uh, I mean, as, as you all know, we are, we are doing this uh, spring school. Uh, we are trying to create a, a network. We are trying to, 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 to help a, a bunch of students uh, to learn more about a particular topic. In this case, it's uh, social XR. Uh, yesterday, we had a, a bunch of tutorials that I'm sure you really enjoy. Uh, today, what we have is a, a number of open lectures now in the morning. As you have probably seen, the, the program suddenly change. <laughs> so, so basically, Christian just, uh, the, uh, his flight was canceled, so, so unfortunately he couldn't make it, which made all the organization team to freak out yesterday afternoon. Uh, but we were very lucky that people were super flexible, so actually we can get a talk now uh, by Sylvia, and then uh, Serene will talk at, at 11. So I'm very pleased to, to introduce uh, Sylvia Pan. She's going to be talking about uh, Virtual social interactions and in applica its applications in health and, and, and healthcare. Um, and Sylvia is professor at, uh, of VR at Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, she co-leads the Goldsmiths Social Empathic and Embodied VR Lab and the MA MS uh, uh, Masters in Virtual and Augmented Reality program at uh, Goldsmiths Computing. And her research interest is in the use of virtual reality as a medium for real-time social interaction, in particular in the application area of training and therapy. And she has an amazing tech talk. She just told me about that. <laughs> so make sure that you check that one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Hi, everyone. Uh, morning. Yeah. So I had to get up at, I don't know, 7 o'clock. So if it doesn't go well, it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I'm slightly jet lagged. London is like uh, one hour uh, behind, so seven o'clock was like six o'clock for me, and it was two days in a row. So let's hope this goes well. So I'm going to talk about virtual uh, social interaction and its application in health and health care, because that's basically what I've, the kind of theme I've been working towards in the past almost 20 years. Um, but before going into virtual social interaction, I was thinking, I think we probably should go back to this concept of real social interaction and what it really means, right? Because I think the concept you know, how everybody think about it have probably changed quite a bit in the past few years. Um, so in order to uh, answer a question, obviously I went to Google. Um, but I did try ChatGPT, but I didn't like the answer, so I'm gonna stick to uh, the answers I got from Google Image. So when I put real uh, social interaction, these are the pictures that um, Google Image health, um, popped up with. And I think we all kind of agree some of it are definitely real social interactions, right? The ones that we are in a shared space and we're kind of paying attention either to each other or to an object of common interest. Uh, it, this object can be um, some kind of board game or maybe a sports we're running together, right? Um, but there are, think there are also type of interactions that some people think is real, some people is less real. Uh, for instance, here I think this group of people are actually playing a video game together. I mean, is that real social interaction or you're kind of more engaging with whatever is going on on the TV screen, right? So I think this is something that's debatable. And I think there are things definitely don't count as so, uh, real social interaction, uh, probably like this image here where this daughter is very upset with his father who is obviously not engaging with her uh, in real life. And also what we often see uh, on a sort of platform, people waiting for the train, but instead of trying to socially engage with each other, they're just all focusing on their phone. Um, and no matter what you uh, agree uh, with, which one's a real social interaction, I think we agree that this is not real social interaction. It's actually quite the opposite. So this actually happened during the pandemic when I was giving a, a talk online to a group of researchers in uh, Israel. And they sent this picture afterwards as a, as a thank you. And I think they're just trying to brag because at the time that London was still under lockdown and Israel, they did some, you know, the government was more proactive. Uh, so what, they were already out of lockdown. So they were able to actually engage, engage with each other in real life. Um, but also they were just bragging about how many VR headsets they have, <laughs> right? This is quite a surreal picture. Um, so, but I think that my point is that I want to kind of start my talk uh, by actually 
uh, instead of <laughs> getting too distracted, dive into sort of virtual social interaction. I want to remind everybody, real social interaction is actually something we're more familiar with as human, be uh, human races. We have evolved millions of years uh, interacting with each other in the real world, right? And this kind of virtual social interaction, no matter which format we're talking about, uh, is only something quite recent. Even you talking about telephone communication only probably uh, existed for decades. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm gonna actually now get everybody to do a bit of activity. Sorry about the ones online, but I'm, I'm gonna actually focus on uh, people in this room. So if we can all have our hand uh, like this, okay? So as soon as you see the next picture, I want you to all open your hand just like what you see. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you to close. And then, yeah, okay. So now I'm gonna ask you to do this again, but I ask you to open your hand as soon as you see the next image, okay? Still open your hand, yeah? <laughs> okay, you can still do it, but you're only able to do it a little slower. Don't worry, this is very normal. That's exactly how everybody uh, does it. So this is something called uh, um, imitation, automatic imitation. That's something we can't help, but we all do. And it's not only kind of in the beginning. Even if you do it repetitively hundreds of times, you, you still have a bit of that, right? Um, so basically, the first one I tried was a congruent condition. The second one was an incongruent condition, right? And then they has been you know, tested many times that we turn to be able to react towards the congruent one a little quicker comparing to the incongruent one, right? And th this difference is called the mimicry effect. And it has been uh, discovered by Hayes uh, back in 2004 and has been tested uh, many times. And this is basically something that happens in the real time, real social interaction that we probably don't even consciously think about. And has been very neatly summarized by Bach and Chatrand as the unbearable automaticity of being. So we will have the tendency to copy each other. We automatically do that in our social interaction. Uh, and it makes sense because we all evolve, uh, you know, over millions of years to be very efficient in understanding and negotiating with each other and by automatically copying each other's action and mannerism in a conversation, we're actually actively taking our conversation partner's perspective, right? And oftentimes this will lead to better communication. Um, but why it is important to understand it, other than the fact that, you know, in order to create virtual social interaction, we need to really understand what's going on in real social interaction. But also, this on its own has implications in real uh, social interaction. For instance, uh, for people with autism, they might have a slightly different sort of brain mechanism behind how they copy uh, each other, right? So this is uh, a theory that's proposed by Antonia Hamilton, who I had the privilege to work with um, about 10 years ago. Uh, so he proposed a theory uh, in 2008. So he explained mimicry, as I explained, is the implicit and automatic copying of detailed kinematic features of an observed action rather than just the action goal, right? So that's what we automatically do. But we also do something else. We also have emulation, wh uh, which is where we copy the explicit goal of an observed action. So as human beings, we all kind of try to do two things at the same time. And I have a clicker here. Sorry about the ones from online. You might not be able to see it, but hopefully I can use this clicker. Uh, oh, sorry, it's the other way um, to see. So basically, for everybody, we have two pathways from the visual input, what we see. We have the automatic imitation. Our sort of motor uh, sort of uh, part of the brain will want to automatically copy everything we see, right? But we have another pathway which is this one, which is emulation. We try to interpret the goal from the visual inputs, and then we do a bit of planning, and then we decide what we do, right? So the theory that is that these two things happen so at the same time. Uh, as we can imagine, if, you know, if I'm having a meeting and I see someone uh, you know, grab a glass of water and have a drink, I might automatically do that, and then so actually, I might reach out my hand already, and I'm thinking, actually, it's good to have a sip of water because I want to keep myself hydrated. Right, so in this case, the lower pathway and the upper pathway kind of arrive to the same conclusion that I need to drink some water. But if I'm at a conference and someone grabbed a can of Coke, I might actually out reach out my hand to grab it and then halfway I stop. Actually, I want to stay healthy, so I don't want to drink that can of Coke, right? So in that case, I had a mimicry reaction, but then I did this part and suppressed my mimicry reaction, so I stopped halfway, right? So that's kind of a 
uh, neurotypical um, uh, action, right? So the theory of why this could be uh, helping for autism is that it might explain uh, people with autism, they might have a still uh, exactly the same as everybody else, this pathway, but their mimicry pathway might not be as strong as uh, everybody else, right? So in order to test that, we actually did an experimental study where we um, got a, well, it's just a psychology student, and we get her to put a Prohemus tracker on her finger, and she also has a tracker on her head, and these are six degree of freedom trackers. So just with these two trackers, we can actually do inverse kinematic, and then uh, uh, reconstruct the animation of someone doing movements like that, right? So in this case, we got her to basically, uh, we had four kind of dots in front of her, and we, we tell her the sequence, say, now you do one, two, three, or you do one, two, four, or you do two, three, four, right? So we give her a bunch of things for her to do. But then we also told her to do these uh, movements in two ways. In one way, she does it with a low trajectory, so she does one, two, three. In another one, she does it intentionally with a high trajectory, one, two, three. Okay, so we recorded everything and then we put that as animation files on the virtual character. We also randomized the order so each participant would have a different order. And now we have the participant to come in uh, and I go through these kind of movement many times, but we also had both neurotypical and participants with ASD as well. So our hypothesis is that uh, everybody would have the tendency to copy the virtual character without realizing they're doing so, um, but we'll see this copying behavior more obvious in a neurotypical participant, okay? And that's exactly what we found. Um, so NT is neurotypical, and the white bar here is when they see the avatar doing the high trajectory movement, right? And that's uh, the y-axis is the peak height. So when they have the high trajectory avatar out of the trials, everything was randomized, um, we do see their average peak being higher as well comparing to the gray bar, which is lower, right? So it's the same for neurotypical and ASD, but as you can see, the difference is much bigger with neurotypical, right? So th that kind of support the theory which I presented uh, earlier. So basically we found in both groups there is evidence for mimicry, but ASD mimicked less. And we actually had another condition, because we think that uh, if the audience effect, like the person actually paying attention to you, would have a social facilitation effect, would actually amplify the mimicry result. So we actually also programmed the avatar to either say, hey, I'm going to be looking at you when you're doing the task, or I'm going to be looking away while you're doing the task. Um, however, with this, so our idea is that when she's looking at you, this mimicry effect will be bigger compared to when she's looking away. But that's not what we found. <laughs> so we actually we found, well, not statistically significant, but we found something slightly different, uh, the opposite. So actually when the avatar is disengaged, the difference between high and low on the y-axis is slightly higher for each group, right? But it's not significant, so it's probably just um, uh, by chance, right? So this is very interesting. Um, we think there could be two reasons. One could be that this is, we didn't actually conduct a study inside virtual reality, um, so it doesn't feel as immersive. Uh, and the second one is that we think when the, because we didn't actually, we just programmed the avatar say, hey, I'm looking at you, and then she just turns her head, because the participant will be wearing a head tracker as well, so she knows where you are, she kind of turns her head slightly. But she wasn't actually programmed to react towards you, if you see what I mean. So if you made a mistake, or if you do it correctly, her face stays exactly the same, which is probably kind of creepy. And that's probably, you know, when she's looking away, it's actually maybe feel, felt more real because she's not paying attention to you, therefore she's not reacting to you. So maybe actually when she's looking away, people felt more engaged with her in that sense. So that's our explanation. But that's really um, interesting. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we, but we thought it also could because it's not uh, it, because it was not done in virtual reality, and uh, yeah, and, and I think now is the point. Actually, go back to you know the kind of where I started, which is basically my research is predominantly uh, inside virtual reality, and this is the kind of uh, you know setup we normally run our experiment with. Um, but before explaining what virtual reality is, uh, I'm gonna actually I'm gonna ask you first. You all tried virtual reality, right? The kind of sixth off headset. Anyone haven't tried it? Okay, brilliant. Um, but still, I'm gonna explain the technology a little bit because uh, uh, I think that's still relevant for us to understand a bit more the psychological impact. So which one do you think these two is longer? 
Okay, you're all clever. It was probably because you saw me doing it in the previous talk or something. Uh, so I'm going to play the video. So this is a, a home recorded video. And I was doing my maternity leave. I have lots of kind of IKEA train track populated around me because I have nothing else better to do. And I discovered this really mind blowing thing for me <laughs> at a time. Right, so they're exactly the same uh, pieces from the same train track. Uh, so despite, despite knowing really well they're exactly the same size, we can't stop thinking that the one on the left is slightly longer. Hopefully, that's how how you feel, right? The one does seem a bit longer. Uh, and, uh, and this is something called an illusion. And that's not the only illusion. There are many of them out there. Uh, so for instance, in the first image, all the horizontal lines are actually parallel, if you look at them closely. Yeah? And then the second image, if you're staring at it, you will notice that it's an image. It's not a GIF. It's not moving. But when you look away, it looks like it's kind of moving, right? And then the third one, I'm just going to have to take my word for it. Um, I know it's difficult to accept. Uh, square A and B are actually exactly the same color, right? Don't do it now, but afterwards you can Google color perception uh, on Google Image and you'll see this color perception illusion on Google Image and you'll see this one. You can use a color picker to, um, to, uh, to check that. Right. So the interesting thing is, I think all these images hopefully show us, our interface with, rea with reality is not as reliable or robust as we'd, we'd, we'd like to think it is. And for me, my definition of VR is that VR is an illusion supported by technology. And through real-time tracking and computer graphics, VR actually taps into our interface with reality, which is not very reliable. And by replacing the world uh, around us with virtual reality, with simulations, VR can actually trigger illusions that could challenge and reshape our belief in the world we live in. And that's kind of the reason why I think VR is a fantastic uh, medium for uh, health and healthcare, and I'll explain in a bit as well. Um, so hopefully you all know kind of how this illusion works. You know, I summarized by, prof by Professor Mouth later back in 2009. When you put a VR headset on, three things happen. First, you see uh, things in uh, 3D stereo. You have one, uh, two image, one for each eye. That's how we see 3D, right? And secondly, there's no escape. It's literally in your face, right? So like when you look around, you're still kind of trapped inside VR. Just like in a way, in real life, we're trapped in reality, OK? And thirdly, you have something called sensory motor contingency. It's actually something quite straightforward. Um, so when uh, in real life, I like to walk around when I give a talk. And as I move, my body detects that I'm moving through my ear. Uh, but I also see things slightly differently, even by small angles I'm moving, right? And my brain automatically integrates this kind of motor and visual uh, perception. And that's how I develop my perception of reality. Right. And in virtual reality, thanks to real-time tracking and real-time graphics and the six degree of freedom tracking, that's really what you need in VR, uh, these two things also holds true. As I move inside VR, the graphics display updates very quickly. And that's normally done within 10 million seconds. Right? That's why for, for VR has that, you need something like 90, frame her, uh, 90 hertz per second. Right? And when that happened, my body really developed the illusion of what I perceive in VR is real. Right, and I really react towards it. Um, so it generates a strong illusion we're somewhere else rather than where we actually are, uh, which might make our action in real life seems a bit ridiculous, but you know we just don't care anymore. And for me, what's really fascinating is not only this um, point of being somewhere else. I think what's really fascinating is with VR, we can actually be with somebody else. And that's obviously, you know, very much the case during COVID. Uh, I think this is a, a party we have uh, we had in VR Chat 2020 around Christmas time. It was a Christmas party, and we were doing karaoke inside VR Chat. I'm gonna just play this video. Can I have sound? You, can, you have to hear my colleague's beautiful singing. Is the sound? Yeah. Can we increase the volume? I know this one's a bit low. And here I had a high five with my colleague. Um, I think we all know kind of, have you all been in social VR before? Has anyone not tried social VR? Okay, it's quite a fascinating experience. I suggest you try it. Without trying it, you don't kind of understand. It's an experience, right? If you never had roller coaster, you never know roller coaster feels, and it's kind of the same thing. Um, okay, so um, 
Yeah, so during the pandemic, I spent quite a lot of time on uh, inside social VR. Uh, we had our student welcome week in our space, which is unfortunately closed. It's uh, actually really good ex for accessibility. I find it's always the easiest social VR to pick up. And then we had project meetings in on Engage. We had international conference social session in Mozilla Hubs. Uh, we had our lab social in Rec Room, where you can actually go play paintball. And I'm really crap at it, and my students love how crap I'm at, <laughs> I am at it. But anyway, I also had actually enjoyed a uh, concert, uh, actually a few of them inside VR chat. There's actually, during film festival, uh, film festivals, you often see there are actually performances in VR chat, and I recommend trying some of them. Um, they're not, most of them are not that great, but I think this is just the beginning of uh, lots of really interesting experiences in this area. Right, so we all know that inside those kind of, uh, the reason why I feel so real is that you can actually drive you, your avatar with your body language. Um, in this case, uh, she is driving her avatar through a Kinect, right? So hopefully soon enough, we'll have a headset with a hand tracking capacity, so you can do better hand tracking, can drive our avatar that way as well, so we don't need the controllers. But for now, normally use controllers, and you can even put some tracking devices on your feet, so you can drive, you can dance inside VR and do all sorts of uh, interesting things. Um, and, uh, and I think yesterday, uh, one of the speakers mentioned as well, soon enough we'll be able to have facial expression integrated in this system as well, because the technology, the hardware is already out there. So we will, and, and also it's a matter of time that we'll have avatars which looks exactly like ourselves inside social VR, having our facial expressions and really engage with each other uh, that way. Right, uh, so yeah, so in social VR basically, uh, we, uh, we will feel that we're in the shared space with another person where we can gesture and use our gaze to socially engage. And um, this is actually quite important and it's very interesting, it has interesting implications for health and health care, which is my area of interest. So we could imagine, you know, Sarah, now when I make appointment to see my, um, my doctor, sometimes they give me a call, sometimes they're in a Zoom session with me. So that's already happening, having computer mediated therapy uh, using, you know, technology remotely, right? So you can imagine actually in the near future Future, people actually have therapies inside social VR when we have social facial expressions and everything as well. And actually, uh, those kind of therapy can make the whole process more anonymous because lots of people are experiencing mental health conditions. They don't want to actually be sort of, you know, themselves in the therapy session because they don't want to talk about their mental health problem. Uh, they want to do it anonymously. And social VR will allow them to do that. And um, I think it's also an interesting case for the aging population. You know, for instance, one of the problems with dementia is they suffer, you know, like social deprivation is one of the things that make their dementia, make, makes their deterioration even worse. But you can imagine with social VR, they can actually experiencing some kind of authentic social interaction without having to be physically with someone if they have mobi mobility issues. Uh, and also another area to highlight is actually a lot of the work in health and healthcare are done by scientists in drug discovery and everything. And one of the problems they have is they have problem even understanding each other's data, each other's research. It's because the thing they do, although it's real, but it's also very abstract, right? So I see lots of like nice 2D images they try to draw, which takes lots of time to try to explain what they do, right? But just imagine you can actually do that inside virtual reality. You can have 3D objects where scientists can explain to each other uh, about their, their scientific discoveries. So I think social VR is going to be something that's going to be quite important in health and healthcare. Um, but the problem, I think, is that at the moment, there's still lots of different configurations technically, and I think the psychological impact of how these systems exactly work is not really well understood. So we conducted some study, hopefully I'll summarize in the next uh, five minutes or so, just very quickly. So one of the things we were looking at um, is, you know, there are, uh, for instance, in, in this image, you can see the two uh, avatars actually look quite different. I was in a robot and my friend was in a kind of more cartoon-like human figure, right? So we want to kind of understand that. Uh, and. Um, and also, you know, so this is the kind of thing that would be considered, there's not much consistency because we're actually in very different form factors um, in that image as well. And some platform uses, oh, what's going on? I don't want that. Okay. Anyway, uh, and uh, um, and there are also uh, platforms use avatars that's more realistic looking, and then platforms use avatars that are more cartoon-like looking, right? So we ran a couple of studies looking exactly at this. 
Okay, so uh, this is the first study we've done. It was actually done in 2018-19, before the pandemic. Um, and uh, so this is a two-by-two two design. Uh, we had two factors. One is self-representation, right? So here we decided to represent one of the participants just with controllers, right? So participant can be represented with either just a pair of controllers, because that's the only thing we render, or they are represented with a full body uh, virtual character because that's more computationally difficult to do, right? So we want to see this kind of uh, uh, setup. And the second factor is consistency. Whether it's consistent, the person you're interacting with have exactly the same body representation or inconsistent, right? Which introduce inconsistency here. And the literature basically suggests inconsistency would lead to a lower rating in trust. So we just want to try to uh, test that. So we had four conditions. Um, basically different combinations of these two factor, right? So you either have participants and um, the other person both represented by full body avatar, or the opposite C, none of them have a full body, just both controllers or uh, inconsistent conditions. Right. And we actually run two studies. In the first study, we use the confederate. So the participant itself is always a, a participant, but the other is always a confederate who just there pretending to be a participant. And what we found is that the confederate, this is something we didn't expect at all. We found that we didn't find anything else, but what we found is when confederate did not have a body, which is condition C and D, participant actually trusted them more. And this was actually supported by a trust game. They invested more money, as well as a sort of slightly weaker result with the questionnaire data as well. So I can see the middle two uh, um, box plot actually higher in terms of the money they receive as well as uh, the score they receive. And that's basically C and D graph there. Okay, and that's very interesting. We didn't expect that at all. And we think, okay, maybe it's because in this case, the confederate is lying to the participant, right? They're pretending to be a participant where they're not. And by not rendering their body, they're actually better at hiding their own, their true intention, right? Maybe the confederate wasn't a great actor, so he was giving away too much. He wasn't being genuine uh, when he was rendered a full body and participant can detect that. So that's kind of the uh, explanation we came up with. So we, we ran another study where we had paired participants, which is a little more tricky to arrange because two of them have to both turn up, otherwise it won't work. Um, and then this time, we didn't find the same thing we found before, so it might mean that our theory is correct. But we also found what we wanted to find, which is that consistency actually played a role in trust. So the one that uh, was in the consistent condition, which is condition A, and C, uh, they had a higher trust score uh, of, um, of each other. So that's interesting. And then we ran another study. This study was with Microsoft Research in Cambridge, uh, where we used the HoloLens. And then this study, we were testing different modalities of the avatars. So we created avatars for each participant based on their photos, but either photorealistic avatar or more cartoon-like avatar, right? Uh, and then we actually tested this setting um, in, uh, we had a, we had, it's a uh, longitudinal study. So the study actually lasted two weeks, right? And so there are 14 participants. They were arranged into six groups. There are groups of either two or three people. And then for the first week, they would have five sessions and they have another five sessions in the second week, right? But we have a randomized order where they either have a cartoon-like avatar in week one and then realistic avatar in week two or the other way. So we want to test which avatar is actually better. So the meeting, another sort of really interesting thing we had is that these are meetings that we're going to have every day anyway. So we're just replacing their real life meetings rather than trying to give them a task to do, right? So but instead of having a meeting on Zoom, um, they were doing it remotely anyway. They had these meetings inside with, with the HoloLens uh, in Microsoft, HoloLens 2. And uh, I don't want to go into too much detail of the result of this, um, but I just want to show you something that's still under review, but I thought this one was very interesting. So I asked participants to rate their own emotions after each session. And uh, okay, this graph is slightly tricky to read. So the x-axis are the five weekly sessions, right? And then the ones, and so these are organized of the four emotions they're rating, and the one on the top, CR is when they have cartoon-like avatar first, followed by realistic avatar, right? And then the yellow one is always cartoon-like avatar, the purple one is realistic avatar, okay? And then the lower one here is realistic and cartoon, so they had realistic avatar first, so they had the 
blue one, uh, the, the purple one first, and then they have the yellow one for lower here. So the, statistics, uh, the significant result we found were actually RC when they had the realistic avatar first, right? And we had two significant results is that first, when they had the realistic avatar first, over the first five days of the first week, their level of optimistic actually decreases, right? And then their level of stress actually increases, right? So I think if I were going to choose the avatar for my you know, everyday 10 minutes meetings, I think I'm definitely with the current technical setup, I'm definitely gonna stick to the cartoon-like avatar. Um, so a quick summary about those social VR studies. So the psychological impact would be very sensitive to small changes in the technical setup in social VR. Um, but obviously the ultimate goal is to try to represent human social signals in a complete way, which I don't think we'll ever be able to do that, but we can always try one feature at a time. And uh, last but not least, consistency matters. So sometimes people will be joining in with different devices Right, and that means that they might not, they might actually, you know, quite difficult to make their representations uh, consistent, but that is the area we need to really work on because that will help with trust. Okay, uh, so talk, going back to virtual social interaction, everything I talked about so far kind of uh, is in this area, social VR, where we go into a place, we see somebody else, uh, and this somebody, this avatar, there's another person behind this avatar, okay? But very often, there's another form of uh, virtual social interaction, which is human agent interaction. We go into VR, or even with a flat screen, we see another um, virtual character, but there isn't a real human behind the virtual character. It's completely agent-based, it's computer algorithm driven, right? And that's also kind of the other side of the uh, spectrum. But I'm now going to show a video uh, which belongs to none of these two. So this is actually where I started uh, VR. We created this in 2005. It was part of my master's thesis. So hopefully we have audio. That shirt looks great on you. How much was it? I think it was about 20 pounds. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm not going to lie. I was That shirt looks great on you. How much is it? I think it was about 20 pounds. It's quite cheap. Thank you very much, though. You look very nice, too. Oh, thank you very much. So here, I don't know how much you can hear the conversation, but basically, she paid a compliment to him, and he was very happy to receive it. He was swinging his body left and right, and he's certainly having fun in this in interaction. And he was enjoying it so much, he actually worked all the way back to the, uh, the back wall of the cave-like system where we run this study in order to be closer to her. But what he didn't realize is we actually programmed her to maintain an interpersonal distance away from him. So the more sh he kind of walked forward, the more she walked backward. Um, so we also programmed gaze interaction and everything, a lot of it as well. So it was really great that um, this actually worked uh, because we wanted to develop a scenario where we can help uh, people who suffer from social anxiety to practice practice um, their interpersonal skills with a virtual character uh, so that they can try to, uh, you know, um, go through that sort of anxiety but in a controlled fashion so they can practice and they can build confidence and they, until they're ready to embrace the real world. Um, uh, so that is, as I said, it actually doesn't belong to either this one or this one. Uh, this the method we use, you can call it a hybrid method or visa of the odds or human in the loop, there are different names of it. But basically what we did is record, we recorded all the sort of animation. I mean, that video in particular was me hand animating her, but we recorded the voice with a professional actress. Uh, and then we, we sort of chop all the sort of clips and then there's experimental in the room triggering all these events at the same time. And that's actually something quite common you see in the setting of training, uh, in particular in health and healthcare, right? Because that's an area where it's high stake uh, and uh, if there is no other way to provide training or uh, treatment for patients, uh, although it costs more than this method, but it's still very prevalent. And also if you connect 
collect enough data with this method, and then you can try to use the data to train an agent to probably make the selections automatically. So that's the hope. So lots of work I say after this point actually uses this method. Uh, and I just want to now show you this video of how we actually use this method to train uh, medical doctors in antibiotics prescription. So as you probably know that there is a sort of disaster emerging about the overuse of antibiotics. So if we all take antibiotics, um, you know, whenever we feel unwell, then uh, the problem is that we're going to develop anti, uh, bac anti antibacteria resistant bugs, which is super bugs. And if you don't do anything, I think about a number here, this could kill 10 million people per year by 2050, right? So all medical doctors have the responsibility to safeguard antibiotics prescription, but sometimes they have very limited time. Um, they are allocated to each patient, and some patient wouldn't take no for an answer, so they find this process actually quite tricky. Uh, so we decided to provide a VR scenario to train them with virtual patients. It is better that we give her some antibiotics to help her immune system. Well, that, unfortunately, that's not how antibiotics work. Yeah, it's they work. Reassuring as I can, I do not think that there it is. It is so unfair. It's going to ruin our holiday. I'm going to take this up with the local health authority. I think you are an unfair demand of medicine to my mother. Okay, I appreciate your concern. Thank you for your feedback. Um, my mother worked and paid national health insurance all her life. Now look at what's happening. Sure. I, I mean, this has got uh, in no way uh, to do with your mother's health insurance payments. It's it only means that old people are just invisible, not treated with respect by the NHS. Thank you very much for sharing. I suppose that this is all government cuts to the NHS. I think now you all you all know how to get antibiotics from your doctors now, but please don't do it because it's really only useful when the doctor thinks you're medically, uh, you know, it's necessary for you. So we ran this study with uh, 21 medical doctors. Actually, 12 of them are doctors. Nine of them are trainee doctors. Can you guess how many of them managed to resist towards the end? Out of the 21, shout out a number. About right, four of them managed to say no, and they, they're all from the 12 experienced doctors. So it's actually quite difficult. And then we actually brought this to the White Hall to show the politicians in the UK. And I remember all the trainees when we were setting it up, and they were like, within a minute, they're like, okay, here's antibiotics, just go, I don't want to talk to you anymore. And then we had a politician who sat down, who went through this again, uh, this with the, with the, um, but the characters, and he was just arguing. He's not even a medical doctor, but he just like he's a politician. He just loves arguing. And his assistant was like next to him, saying, "You're late for your next meeting." I said, "No, this is important. Let me finish." <laughs> so it does show that you know this kind of argument actually you you become better at it uh, through experience and VR is a way to actually simulate that experience for you to practice this, right? Um, okay, so we also done some uh, study in the area of child safeguarding. So that is an area that is really, because it's really interesting when I work with medical doctors, they run something called simulation. But by simulation, they actually meant practicing with real actors. <laughs> there's nothing digital involved when they say the word simulation, right? But there's one tricky area they can't do deal with in their own simulation, which is anything invo involving a minor, a child. Right, and so they have this very tricky area of child safeguarding, right? So you know, not and particularly not all sort of child safeguarding situation ended up in in hospital in the way you'd expect. So when a child ended up at A and E, it's normally already too late to do anything about, right? Lots of abuse is actually psychological. It doesn't really have sort of physical um, uh, sort of uh, harm to the extent you would imagine. So it is medical doctors, like general practitioners in the GP, they're kind of family doctors. It's their responsibility to try to spot any problem as much as, as possible, because they are kind of the primary contact points of how families are connected to the society, right? Um, but they often find it quite difficult, right? So no matter how much training you give them, you, you explain to them that's how it works, it might be difficult. Um, so we developed a uh, child abuse scenario with Professor, well, child safeguarding scenario with Professor Carolyn Futterman, who is a consultant pediatrician. She's also the co-author of the Child um, Protection Practice Many. So I'm gonna play the, this kind of cue we developed together. Oops. Oh, is that on the video? Oh, sorry, I can't play it. <laughs> Apologies. But anyway, uh, can, can you see this? Oh, sorry, I have strange things popping up on my uh, uh, PowerPoint. I want me to do, but you can see it, so I'm just gonna carry on. Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna play this study we've done in the cave-like system. Options to have 
um, surgery through the chest to replace the valve, and one is um, yeah, that's open heart surgery. Exactly. The up. Exactly. So I probably should explain. So the uh, so it's a father coming in with the child, and if you could see in the child abuse cue in the beginning when they sat down, there was already something quite obvious that going on between the father and the child. But the consultation t consultation session actually focuses on the father who need to decide between two quite intense operations, right? So we make it quite cognitively and emotionally demanding. I want to test if the medical doctors can are still able to spot the problem between the father and the child, which we think was so obviously there, right? And the other option is to try and replace the valve um, through a, uh, with less sort of, less invasive, as we call it, so uh, through a, a catheter into the heart, which they uh, sort of, they don't have to cut you open. So that might be a better option. Yeah. That's the red one, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. I'm worried it could happen if I didn't go into the heart. Cool. Worse it could happen with any procedure like that is that you well, worse it could happen than obviously is that you don't survive it and open the heart surgery after that. That's why it's better to try and replace the valve through a catheter into the heart. Yeah. Which is what they do with the open heart surgery. Yeah. 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 I'm going to do that. For God's sake, I'm having an important conversation with you, you little shit. Tell me how you're coming. Just cross your legs. This is fine by the four. I don't mind if Tom wants to go to the loo and then you can bring him back. Hello, oh, mate. to leave uh, and then yeah and some of the doctors actually ask Tom to do so. um, but anyway so let's jump to the measures so the way we try we run it with uh, 63 medical doctors and the way we evaluate it is because they actually the you know the, the reason why we're running it in a cave like system is because they needed to have notes on the computer and we'd find it quite difficult to simulate especially with at the time the resolution in VR headset are quite low uh, so we had to do it in the VR system and they can see their laptop and then after the father and son left they then can type notes on the laptop just as they do uh, in a real consultation um, and then we then give the notes to 10 how many independent readers? Ten independent readers. They're all trained in child protection and everything, so they can read uh, if the notes actually pointed out the potential child abuse and also the the process, the process the, that's required uh, to be taken, right? Because this is the point where you either put it in the notes and it get get some attention, get dealt with, or you're missing a very important point where we can potentially save lives, right? And I think it's all obvious to you that the father wasn't the nicest father to the child, even for our untrained eye. Um, so we also collected some, so the, that note result, the average of that 10 readers is our main dependent uh, variable. And our independent variable, which is um, what we test before they come here, is the stress level, uh, the doctor's self-reported stress level, and the big five personality. And here's the result. So uh, this is the, um, the x-axis is the perceived stress level. The higher means they're more stressed. And the y-axis is the average score uh, of the note they took. And as you can see, <laughs> some of the doctors received a really low mark, right? Some even received zero across all 10 readers. So this will be the doctor who didn't even mention there was a child in the room. Right? And it's a highly unusual to take your young child for a discussion about you know, a really important surgery, and some doctors even, even dis uh, forgot to mention it. Right? So we can see there is a negative correlation between perceived stress and the quality of note, which means that the more stressed you are, the more likely your note is not that great. So it's probably good evidence to tell the government, look, if you want to actually save money uh, in, in health and health care, you need to make sure the doctors are not stressed because otherwise they will cost, they will bring up the cost for later on because you don't want a child to end up in a hospital or in the news. That's going to really cost you quite a bit. Um, there are also correlations uh, of uh, their big five and these three are significant. So we found a positive correlation between agreeableness and extroversion to the quality of note. We found a negative correlation of uh, neuroticism with the quality of note. So this probably is useful in terms of providing training for medical doctors. There are 
you know, certain personality traits might need more help in this type of training. So this, again, is not something that's possible to actually get without virtual reality. Uh, and I think I'm going to skip this part uh, and then just sort of play one last video. So there's something else, kind of follow up we study we've done. And I felt um, was actually not in any of these three. It was actually just playing out a sort of social interaction in front of uh, the participant. But this is a collaboration study uh, with uh, Zurich University of Applied Sciences. They're a bunch of researchers in social workers. So they want to try to help social workers to understand the impact of domestic abuse could have on, on the children, right? Because some of the domestic abuse we experience, uh, family experience in everyday life is not physical. And when that is the case, the social workers often neglect the impact it would have in a, in a child. So this is a study that uh, has been just accepted as a poster to present at HRP VR when we're running a larger scale study. Uh, does it work? Sorry. Here we go. So first they scanned the room, um, and now we have two actors. Sit the f up! So I'm talking to you. We use real actors, and the, the per performance and everything is really real. Um, and then the, uh, the here's the embodiment stage. So you first inside VR, you are inside a, a child. You can play with those cubes, and you can put a hat on yourself to really establish that connection. Uh, and then the next moment. Um, you are sitting next to a breakfast table. And have I've got to go soon. I'm going to be late. Don't worry. The coffee's almost ready. It won't be long. We can start soon. So, Maya and Judith are meeting the children at the playground after school today. You've got time for a coffee, but you don't have time to clean. To clean the flat. You can't even do that! I mean, look, look at the state of the place! It's a mess! And I'm supposed to give you money! For what? Yeah, don't, don't make me do things I, I don't want to do. I have to get the call. SHUT THE F*** UP! I'M TALKING TO YOU! So it's already quite stressful looking Calm at... down, please. Leave me alone. You want me to calm down, eh? Huh? Are you out of your mind? You're gonna make me f***ing late! Is that your fault if I lose my job? Right, so, yeah. It's even quite stressful to watch it on a screen, so you can imagine how it is to actually experience in VR. And we run a condition whether you're experiencing it inside the body of a child or from a third person perspective. We want to see if embodiment here does add anything. Um, because I think it's proposed by the social worker group, they think that so if they have a more kind of experience of the scenario, then they will remember it better next time when they deal with a similar situation. They will understand the psychological impact the child is suffering and make sure they actually spend some time on resources on, um, you know, potentially helping the child. Um, yeah, so I just want to say, um, you know, wrap up the kind of virtual social interaction area I'm working on. I kind of started as a computer scientist and then I started working with psychologists and neuroscientists to really, you know, have proper experimental method and really understand the brain mechanism behind social interaction, which I found really useful. Um, but then after moving to uh, Goldsmiths, I started working with medical doctors, but also started working with creatives and actors. And I feel a lot of things we do in this space, there is a lot we can collaborate and learn from those kind of people who does performance at their job, right? And lots of things they can't even express with language. You can't really get them to, you know, act it out for you. And I think that's a really, really interesting approach and I always encourage you to, to take. Before I move on, I forgot to ask, so how many of you are actually from, say, a cognitive science background? And how many of you consider yourself like an engineer from computer science? And uh, how about the rest of you? <laughs> Or is it that's everybody? Okay, good, yeah. So I wanted to ask this question in the beginning, but anyway. So I just want to wrap up my talk in the next five minutes, or three minutes, I think. Yeah, um, yeah. I just want to show you this two image. Um, so the one on the, the left is a 2004 image of how computers sees us now, right? So for, com for most computers, most digital interaction we have, which is one eye, because you don't have stereo vision, and you have two ears, because you have stereo audio, right? And then 
you know, we we're just like one finger to click the like button or make a purchase, right? So this is how computers are seeing us. Most of the time when you're on your phone, this is how you interact with computers. And for them, for, you know, UX designers, that's how, who you are, right? And I'm, I appreciate yesterday we had someone uh, explain haptics, right? So this is the kind of uh, uh, representation of how much sort of uh, sensory um, our brain is allocated to different body part uh, of our body. Right, so this is kind of how we actually are, right? So this is the sensory homunculus, but actually there's a motor homunculus which looks very similar, big hands and, and big face. And what I think, why I think you know, VR is a great space to, to work in is I feel that, you know, I feel modern technology is trying to squeeze this monster into that one. I think VR is probably our way out of this, right? Because with virtual reality, instead of interacting with one finger, we're actually interacting with our full body, you know, and we have our facial expression now integrated as well. And if you look at this monster, it has big hands and big face, and that's exactly where we have the VR controllers and headset. That's the bit we're tracking, and we can render all sorts of video, audio, or even haptic uh, output, right? So I think this could be the device that really help us to return to who we really are. Because I think if we don't do this now, digital technology is going to cause more kind of uh, uh, stress and, and mental health issues. Um, yeah, and I've, on that I conclude my talk. So I run a master degree with my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Gillis, and then our students are um, half of them come from technical background, the other one, uh, the other half from the creative background, and I think it's really, really important in, for the future of XR to combine these two skill set together. And this is kind of something they do within two weeks, studying with us to create some sort of silly VR AR filters. Uh, but you know, it's actually really fun. I love them. Uh, so this is my research lab. We have about ten people working in sort of all sorts of different areas, including embodiment, AI, uh, theater, and immersive experiences. And, uh, and these are a bunch of fantastic collaborators we have the privilege to work with. And we also uh, enjoy meeting each other in real life as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. So maybe if anyone has a question, then these two people will go and give you the microphone. And if, if you can repeat the question, yeah, just because for the online people. Yeah. Good morning. Thanks very much for a, for a very nice talk. Um, the studies that you've done in the VR space, how, how reproducible are they? Have you had the ability to run similar studies multiple times and, and compare the results, not within one study, but, but um, uh, to get a feeling of, of what's anecdotal and, and what's, uh, what's more predictive? That's a great question. So I'm going to repeat it. It's about uh, the VR, uh, the social VR study we have run. Is that something that's robust? Can we actually repeat it? Uh, and how much of it is anecdotal? And how much of them are, sorry, what did you say in the end? Uh, I don't know, but I think robust, uh, <laughs> let's use that as, you know, I mean, how, how uh, solid are they and how, how solid soft are they? That's, yeah. I guess, the real question. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the answer is no, we're not able to repeat that. And I think one of the, I asked a kind of a similar question yesterday to uh, the second keynote, what's her name? Uh, I think it's USA, she's from? Uh, Catherine. Catherine, yeah. So I asked if she has run her study on Unity or she just used existing social VR platforms because mm -hmm. you know network development is really difficult, especially for a small research lab, right? Um, but for one of the studies, so yeah, so the second study was based on Microsoft Mesh, uh, and that one depends on how Mesh evolves. We probably could repeat that. We're currently doing something with them, which is under a, behind an NDA, and I can't talk about. And then for the in-lab one, we did repeat the study twice. Uh, and then, but the first one was with a, co a confederate, and the second one was with participants. And we and we were hoping to do a larger scale one, but then COVID happened. So we, and that, you know, although it's a social VR work but it was actually set up in you know, a kind of local, local network, right? right? Because we don't have the capacity to have a proper, I mean, if we have the money to hire a network engineer, great, right? But we don't have, the, we don't have that kind of money. So if I do get the money, I'd love to run more studies. Um, but for now, I think it's just really, you know, we're gonna have to do with whatever we can do. But I, I do think there is more studies, controlled studies that's needed in this area. And as I said, in terms of robust, we did use both questionnaire as well as, um, 
like uh, investment games, you know, how much money you actually invest. And we use all sorts of questionnaires to check you know, how much are they, what's the consistency and everything. And I think it's also important to probably run interviews as well. So not only questionnaires, but actually get people to talk about it. And I think there's so much we can learn from that. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Oh, hi, I just have one question. In your experiment, I want to know the population size. For example, in the autistic children, you have no more people and uh, the autistic individuals, so I want to know the population. Yeah. So I don't remember the precise number, but I think it's in the region about 20 each group. Yeah, because okay. you're right, with uh, ASD, is the recruitment is a real issue. But at the time, I was in a group that is specialized in, in uh, running experiments with, with autism. And that wasn't children, by the way, it was actually adults. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, with regard to your uh, study um, on uh, trust and yeah. the effect of uh, embodiment on trust, uh, I found it really interesting that you said that the um, uh, when there was nobody, there was more trust because the real the Confederate the is trying to lie. was giving away the the lies of yeah. the Confederate. Um, I thought this is this is a very kind of positive um, view on the avatar, right? Because it's interpreting the quality of the avatar of being able to give away these cues that the person is lying. Um, could it, could it be the other way around where in fact like the uncanniness of the um of the avatar is kind of causing the distrust somehow mm. i mean i think if that's the case then we would have somehow to some extent reproduced the result in our second study but we didn't see that at all right it was just completely non existent right so we kind of have to exp find an explanation so whatever is happening is due to the fact that the first study there is a confederate right and we found that's probably the best way of explaining it. But if you come up with something else, please let us know. Yeah. Thank you for a very nice talk. My question is that, for example, <coughs> uh, for the study two that you described, the uh, analysis was mainly based on the uh, quantitative uh, results that came from the rating that the participants put on that. But uh, in the human-centered part, uh, could we consider the results that you have mainly point to the technology aspects or no, you could consider this result as a both parts, technology aspects, the rating that participants gave to the technology or the human factor results that they, uh, I, I want to say your analysis could consider both technology and human center part yeah. or no? I think, that, I think that's a great point. You know, as I said, I'm an engineer and this kind of learning to try to evaluate a system is already something I had to learn from psychologists, neuroscientists, and I found that really fascinating to actually find a way to evaluate a system I develop. This is new to lots of computer scientists, right? So, but I think this group, Pablo's group here, exactly, you guys are a lot more human-centered than the human-centered we thought we've been doing. So I would love to have conversations about, okay, how do we actually, so actually, I think I'm, I think yesterday, uh, Heis mentioned that as well. I think in order for this area to progress, we need a kind of mixed, uh, <coughs> mixed evaluation model, we need quantitative and qualitative. And that's the bit I don't really know much about, right? But I think really in order to progress, we need, we need to involve both. And I was talking to, because I'm now kind of more involved in health and healthcare, and I was talking to people who work in psychiatry, and I was like, hey, you can't just do questionnaires. You have to, you know, have some, you know, measures of how they move, because I'm all about quantitative. And then they were like, no, 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 it's all about what they say. It doesn't matter what they do. It's really about this conversation you then have with them, because it's very subjective. It's on its own, it's a very subjective thing. And that made me think, yeah, that's right, right? But, you know, I don't know much about it, and I would love to, love to collaborate or learn from you guys. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. We have a project for you, chocolate. Oh, nice, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I, I hope there is coffee outside. Uh, then we continue by 11. I see Sarah is already there. Thank you so much for coming early today. Uh, so, so just uh, keep it going and relax a bit. I thought that it's already too much and then I can have to give you more space. Thank you. Thank you so much.
parts. It was amazing. It was really good. And I didn't know the parts were broken. You got to push it with your hand.
stuff? Oh, okay. Because people have the tendency to only report the ones where you see uh, synchrony in movements, right? Or, or in, in I've heart rate. Seen many studies in real life yeah. regarding the synchrony. But I want to no, do it using yeah. physiological we signals. We haven't done, I don't think we've done, phys uh, I don't know that a research lab have done physiology synchrony. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of any study yet, but it could be just I haven't looked at the literature in this area for a while. Yeah, but I feel the problem is like sometimes you see lots of study reported, it worked, right? But if you run 100 study, five of them is going to work statistically, right? So the problem is... Stuff? Oh, okay, I see. You think this has nothing to do with you. Yeah, but anyway, so who, whose lab are you working in? In Nile, uh, 
Yeah. In yeah. And me, if you're interested, drop me an email because I, I am looking for papers for our special track. Uh, okay. um, so so basically, basically, we're doing XR, uh, house and house care, and effective computing. So yeah. exactly that kind yeah, of thing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'm trying to get basically people interested in the area to go to MIT. Yeah. Because I remember studying your courses in Coursera when I joined. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> cool, yeah. <laughs> nice, nice to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, drop me an email if you're interested in publishing, uh, or I can uh, send you an email. If you put your email there, and then when we have the call out, I will. Uh, Thank you for your talk. I think you, ju you just listened to the, all the papers that I've been reading like oh during really? my last two oh. or three years of PhD. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. That's a happy coincidence. Yes. Because well, I thought, I thought w it was like... I was very stressed of in, not in particular, the, 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 the one with the, uh, the interactive, collaborative interaction with the cubes, uh, the, the one with the, the comrades and the... Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's Harris paper. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, cool. Well, yeah. I also have, I think I have to, I have to introduce myself because I've yeah. just spent...
Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to the second uh, keynote of uh, this morning. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Zerin. Zerin Yumak is an assistant professor in the Human Centered Computing Group in uh, the University of Utrecht. She is the scientific director of the Motion Capture and Virtual Reality Lab, and she has 15 years of experience in the area of believable virtual humans and social robots, in particular non-verbal behavior synthesis, multi-party interaction, and emotion and memory modeling. And her talk today will be titled How to Create Virtual Humans and Avatars for Social XR. So a round of applause for Serin. And Okay, good morning everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and thanks very much Irene for the nice introduction. Um, so yes, uh, my name is Irene Yumak. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Human Centered Computing Group um, and I have been working a lot on the area of socially interactive uh, digital humans but also earlier on physical social uh, robots. So today I'm going to talk about uh, how we can create uh, virtual characters um, automatically using AI-driven algorithms and how we can generate uh, interaction uh, for them. So this is the outline of the talk. Uh, the first part of the talk, mainly 70% of the talk, I would say, will focus on animation from a 3D graphics point of view, uh, how we can model the characters and then make them move. So I will focus uh, on uh, the an in short introduction of body and facial animation, and later I will um, switch to the part on nonverbal behavior synthesis, which is my major uh, area in, in, in terms of uh, animation generation. So it's also called social animation, in particular generating facial expressions, gestures and gaze behaviors. Uh, the second part of the talk will focus on interactions, so more on AI and HCI, home computer interaction perspective, how we can make these characters conversationally uh, interactive uh, with us. Uh, so I will introduce the sensing, decision-making, acting loop, and I will uh, introduce some of the work we, will, we have been doing in my uh, lab uh, on modeling emotions and memory and also multi-party interactions. Okay, so let's start. Um, so if you look at the state of the art of digital humans, we started to see very impressive examples nowadays. Um, these are um, some of the recent examples from Unreal Engine MetaHumans. So being someone working on the digital humans area for 15 years, this, is, this uh, state uh, is very exciting, very impressive at the moment. The last couple of years uh, we reached to, to this state and it's, it's accessible in, in game engines at the moment and uh, we can really push the boundaries of uh, realistic na natural interaction uh, with uh, uh, digital humans. Uh, we started also to see these characters in, in games. Um, I just want to ask quickly, who are, uh, are, are you uh, familiar with, with a few of these games? Yeah, okay, I see people nodding. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, for example, um, uh, the game Detroit Becoming Human, it, it includes very realistic virtual characters. These characters are especially uh, used uh, in games with a, um, a realistic uh, storyline. And um, um, on the other hand, there are other type of applications where you can see a range of appearance and animation quality. So on the one hand, there are very realistic games, but uh, you can also have, um, uh, for example, VR simulations um, that are focusing on specific uh, problems, um, such as the one from Tailspin, it's a Dutch company, um, uh, also um, based in, in Silicon Valley. Uh, which is uh, um, um, generating um, simulations for nonverbal communication skills training, in particular soft skills, uh, for, for example, job interview scenarios, or another one, uh, another Dutch company, the simulation uh, crew. Uh, so then you can see in, in that kind of applications the, the, the appearance quality and animation quality of the characters are a little bit different. And on the other hand, uh, end of the spectrum, we also have, for example, in social VR, uh, Facebook uh, Meta uh, virtual characters or um, Microsoft uh, Teams. So uh, we are not very impressed yet with the, uh, the appearance and animation of the uh, virtual characters in, in, in uh, um, uh, Meta. Um, but um, the idea here is that, of course, when you start to have um, uh, platforms that are uh, with uh, many, many users, of course, you have to make some choices, uh, but there is still 
a lot of things to be done in that area in terms of improving the, the quality uh, of the movements um, and the appearance of these characters. And also deciding on in which platforms, which kind of characters will be interesting to use. For example, uh, if you are using a meta type of very cartoonic characters that are reporting from a war zone, that will not be very, very convincing. So you have to make certain choices what kind of characters will be convincing in certain contexts. <coughs> So um, now I want to start a little bit um, in terms of like an introduction to um, uh, body and uh, facial animation. Uh, I'm not sure uh, whether you are a little bit um, um, aware of these topics or knowledgeable, but um, the word animation, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, it means to give life to, is based on the Latin word anima, meaning bread and spread, so you can also find it in the word animal. And animation is the process of making illusion of motion. So we are all uh, uh, familiar with, with cartoons from our childhood. Computer animation, uh, on the other hand, is computer-based imagery, uh, computation used producing images intended to create perception of uh, motion. Uh, so there are not so many, uh, there, there are quite some uh, books on keyframe animation uh, or artistic animation, um, you can find on Amazon everywhere, but there are not so many uh, books on the technical aspects of uh, animation. This is one of the very good books uh, from uh, Rick Parent, and if you want to step into this, this topic, I would highly recommend uh, to start with that. <coughs> um, we can classify the animation in three uh, high-level categories. The first category is artistic animation, so where the uh, there's an artist that, that crafts the motion using keyframing and interpolation, so that is a very time-consuming area. Um, a second category is data-driven animation, where you use motion capture devices and use machine learning AI algorithms to regenerate motion. And the last category is procedural animation, where you use computational models of motion uh, by setting, for example, uh, conditions for physical and behavioral simulation, so it's really mathematical simulations. Um, I'm mainly working in the second category, data-driven animation, but depending on the application, I also had to have to use the first one or the, the, the third one. But my, my major area is um, uh, motion capture and AI-driven uh, animation synthesis. Okay, motion capture. Um, it's possible to, to collect uh, data with uh, motion capture devices. There are diff different type of devices, for example, optical motion capture. And there you can have passive, active, uh, and markerless motion capture uh, systems. Uh, here you see an image from our motion capture and virtual reality lab where two of my students, master students, are interacting in a, in a, in a full uh, face and body tracking uh, suites uh, using a passive marker system. They, these are retroreflective markers. They are like small dots that you attach to the, to the body of the, the uh, actors and actresses. Um, but the community is also moving more towards markerless motion capture, uh, which is um, um, very useful for situations where you want to capture people outside. For example, if you want to capture people um, um, in, in a sport, in a game, um, and you don't want to rely on very um, high um, investments, uh, bulky systems, then it, it's, it's the way to go. But on the other hand, these systems, uh, computer animation pipelines, are still very, very useful if you want to generate high quality animations for games and VR. And of course, you can also uh, use inertial uh, uh, systems uh, with uh, accelerometers, gyrometers, etc. So how can we represent virtual humans? Uh, virtual humans are represented with a skeletal model. Uh, in the image here, you can see maybe it's visible. There's a mesh, it's a polygonal mesh, and then inside the polygonal mesh, there's a skeleton uh, with a lot of joints, and these joints are uh, structured in a, a tree a hierarchy, starting from the root node, um, and then as you move uh, the, the upper um, uh, parent nodes in the hierarchy, uh, the skeleton is, is moved. So as you move one bone on the uh, hand, the vertices that are surrounding the, the um, the, the skeleton are also moved uh, along, so you can consider the skeleton as a low-level representation of this polygonal uh, mesh. 
Um, and for a character, you can define um, uh, different degrees of freedom. For example, uh, for this character, you have three translational degrees of freedom and 48 rotational degrees of freedom. And depending on the joint, you can have, for example, for the knee, one degree of freedom, uh, for the wrist, two, and uh, for the arm, you can have three degrees of uh, freedom. And you can put constraints uh, to decide on uh, how much these, these bones are uh, going to, to move. So if you want to define animation, you just need to configure this over a timeline, basically. Uh, there's a closer look at the skeleton um, hierarchy and uh, the, the polygonal mesh surrounding it. Uh, as I described, uh, as you move one of the bones, the, the vertices in the mesh moves along. And this process is called uh, skinning, and skinning is an um, uh, important um, industrial but also research uh, uh, problem. Um, so, if we summarize the skeleton posing process, it will be composed of three stages. The first stage is uh, where you set all the degrees of freedom, uh, which is defined by a high-level animation system. For example, if you are working with Unreal Engine uh, or, or Unity, you tell your character to do a certain action, yeah, for example, walking or dancing, and all these degrees of freedoms are defined by the high-level animation system. And then they are sent to the rigging system, uh, which is the skeleton and the skinning uh, of the character. And uh, uh, you apply a recursive traversal through the hierarchy from the root node and use forward kinematics to compute the world matrices because we have to compute everything in world space uh, for computer graphics. And then after the rigging system, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, change of the skeleton, uh, these uh, world matrices are used to deform the skin, uh, which is done by the skinning system and uh, finally sent to the, to the renderer. Um, traditionally, um, skinning algorithms are based on uh, linear blend skinning, or it's called also called smooth skinning algorithms. Uh, but these algorithms have some limitations, as you see here in the examples. Uh, this is a a called the skin collapse or bending effect or candy wrapper effect. Because of the linear inter interpolation, uh, you lose some of the vertices here, and these kind of limitations are later um, um, solved with the introduction of dual quaternion blending. Uh, dual quaternion blending uh, is a, a special type of mathematical representation where you can represent both rotations and uh, translations together in terms of quaternions, which allows you to do um, uh, better interpolation uh, instead of linear interpolation. You can use spherical interpolation, for example and which resulted in uh, better um, uh, improvements on the, on the skinning algorithms. And currently, in most 3D modeling tools, such as Maya and Blender, you find a version of uh, this kind of dual quaternion blending algorithms. As I said, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a large topic, so I will not really talk about a lot in the skinning uh, topic. Uh, um, but uh, if you are, are interested in that type of research, I would highly recommend uh, this SIGGRAPH course uh, about skinning, where you can see uh, different type of uh, methods, including direct methods and data-driven uh, approaches. So that was so far body animation. I would like to also talk a little bit uh, introduction to facial animation. Um, different from body animation, facial animation is quite difficult. Um, because face is a very complex structure. Uh, anatomically, it's composed of uh, a lot of tissues and bo as well as bones. And they're also very familiar to us. So um, um, if something is off on the face, we are very much um, attentive to that and we immediately realize. That's because there is this effect called, uh, called uncanny valley. When we look at um, uh, digitally produced uh, faces, we are very much um, 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 affected if something is, uh, is not done properly. Um, there are different types of ways to capture, uh, to generate facial animations. Of course, traditionally, if we are doing it with keyframe animations with a huge team of artists, and it's very time-consuming and costly. On the other hand, you can capture facial animation with f 4D scanners, uh, which produces quite uh, realistic results. But the challenges there is you have a point cloud data, and you have to, of course, uh, register a mesh to it and then uh, uh, fit a skeleton or uh, create a, um, a wide range of uh, blend shapes. Uh, but still, uh, the facial deformation itself is, can be nicely captured with this kind of uh, methods. Uh, I mentioned about the uncanny uh, valet theory. Who uh, is familiar with this concept? 
okay, a lot of people, but I will briefly, briefly touch to that. Uh, so this is a concept uh, originally coming from robotics, uh, actually, but also uh, used uh, for uh, digitally produced uh, characters. So um, um, as the, the uh, human likeness of these characters are increasing, the affinity or let's say the likability of these characters increases to a certain point, and there's a, a sudden drop, which is called the uh, uncanny valley. And um, um, it has been a, a quite a problem, challenging problem to um, um, go over this uh, valley in the robotics and um, uh, digital humans, uh, computer animation area. Uh, but recent research work, uh, for example, from 2021, um, ascending from the valley can state of to art, photorealism avoid the uncanny, started to show signs of um, passing over this uncanny valley uh, because we started to produce very, very convincing uh, digital uh, characters. Um, the basics of facial animation, the widely used methods, is blend shape animation. Uh, you can consider a facial model, for example, con composed of hundred blend shapes, of thousands of blend shape shapes, depending on the complexity. And from an industry term, these are called slider values or blend shape targets, but from a math per, uh, point of view, they are weights and basis vectors. So you have the blend weights and the blend shapes. Um, and you, you take a sum of these um, and uh, you can combine the resulting phase. So you have, a, let's say, 100 dimensional space where you combine all these different type of expressions such as happy, sad, angry, or maybe mouth uh, movement, and you create the, the, the finalizing uh, uh, resulting uh, phase uh, in this multidimensional uh, space. Of course, because it's a multidimensional space, uh, you can apply all kind of uh, data analysis algorithms uh, on, on this uh, uh, space, uh, uh, such as dimensionality reduction. Um, one big challenge is, of course, how to construct these blend shapes. There are different type of methods to do that. Uh, for example, in Lord of the Rings, uh, there were 675 uh, morph targets or blend shapes, and usually um, skilled artists deform a, a, a mesh. Uh, it can be scanned from a, a real actor or we can use 3D construction of, uh, from images uh, or using um, uh, 4D uh, scanners. Um, apart from blend shapes, uh, one other technique that has been used uh, was parameterization uh, of uh, faces. Um, because faces are composed of uh, a lot of vertices and it's a complex topology. People were thinking how can we represent them in a uh, low dimensional space. In the early days, for example, there were um, MPEG-4 um, uh, facial animation uh, parameters and facial definition parameters. There's also other standards. Standards. This is just an example, such as facial action coding. Uh, but for um, uh, low cost uh, transmission, uh, MPEG-4, for example, was used uh, widely uh, uh, in the in the earlier days. Um, so in the image, you can see the arrows here represent the facial animation parameters and the points uh, which define the facial uh, 3D face geometry, these are the facial definition uh, parameters. Um, so I mentioned about data-driven and procedural approach. So one way of producing speech animation for the face is uh, procedural animation. So what you can do here is you can um, um, find the building blocks of audio or text, which are called the phonemes. And for each phoneme, you can create a mapping uh, with them these are the visual co counterparts of uh, phonemes. Uh, and at a very simple level, you can just uh, interpolate these, these uh, phonemes to create uh, the finalizing uh, lip-synchronized speech animation. It sounds easy, but in practice, <laughs> it's not really working uh, that straightforward because there's a, uh, a phenomenon called co-articulation. Uh, when we are talking, these phonemes are overlapping to each other and effective each uh, affecting each other, as well as the, the, the uh, rhythms. Um, that's because um, it is, it's quite difficult to capture um, these uh, realistic representations of the lip-synchronized speech. And um, um, so, um, actually, the speech animation community and the graphics animation community is um, focusing on this problem for several years now, and it's not, it has not been fully resolved. Uh, still, there are still uh, work that is pushing the boundaries on making the, f uh, the lip synchronized speech very, very realistic because it's also very personalized, depends on the person, um, the language used, etc. Um, 
procedural approach uh, in the early days were not working very well because they were mainly based on rules that were derived uh, from linguistic studies um, and they were not um, producing very convincing animations. Uh, that's because uh, data-driven approaches were, were introduced. Um, but uh, in the last couple of years, uh, there were kind of a striking back uh, from this uh, procedural uh, approach um, uh, uh, line of research. So one example here is uh, Jolly. Um, here they were using uh, lip and jaw movements uh, separately to um, create realistic um, uh, lip-synchronized speech animation. And uh, this um, uh, research work, which was SIGGRAPH 2016, uh, also became um, a company later, and uh, it was used in, in a lot of games, such as uh, Cyberpunk, for example. Uh, on the other hand, there are uh, other methods which are data-driven, so you can learn uh, co-articulation and lip-synchronized speech animation from, uh, from data. This is one of the early works uh, dating back to 2005, so the data-driven animation um, is, uh, is, is riding in, rising in the last couple of years, but it's not something completely new. There were a couple of works uh, that has been done in the, in the last uh, 15 years. Um, so in this work, um, there the, the system takes an audio uh, of input sequence and, um, and there's an animation uh, graph, or it's called a motion graph uh, technique, uh, where you um, 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 create building blocks of the animation that was captured with the motion capture device and then you combine and stitch them together later using a sophisticated algorithm. And there is an uh, emotion classifier to understand the state of the emotion from the uh, audience uh, uh, input sequence. And these are combined to, to create expressive lips synchronized speech animation. Um, if you look a little bit more closely to the architecture here, so I mentioned about anim graph or the motion graph. So you, you can see here there's a uh, node for the representation of each uh, of these uh, small uh, chunks of motion. And each of them is composed of four components, uh, the phoneme label, trajectories of the procedure features that are coming from the audio, um, compressed animation uh, motion, and uh, the emotion label. And on the other hand, uh, you can uh, 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 do phoneme labeling and extract the features uh, uh, yeah, regarding the emotional uh, uh, state, maybe it's a happy or frustrated. Um, and then you can use this information to do a constraint graph search algorithm to at the end generate an animation sequence that is following these this, uh, uh, constraints. For example, your constraints could be um, to find the right path that is satisfying a certain emotion or smoother animation. Um, so these were mainly based on optimization-based algorithms. Um, in the years uh, around 2013 and onwards, of course, these were the years that where Kinect and Depth cameras were very popular, and people started to look into video-based facial animation. Uh, the earliest work on this is online modeling for real-time facial animation from SIGGRAPH 2013, and we have seen uh, different variations of this work in the, in the following years. Um, so using, for example, a video uh, camera, single video camera, uh, using a mobile phone camera, etc. And uh, um, uh, these works also led into a company called uh, FaceShift uh, for markerless motion capture, which is now part of your iPhone. Um, so data-driven, audio and text-driven face and body animation is a very fast-growing field in the last couple of years, thanks to the uh, improvements in machine learning and deep learning. So uh, in the first, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, 20 years ago, there were sporadically some data-driven uh, work, but in the last 10 years, we started to see a lot of work uh, that is based on uh, motion capture and data-driven methods, also video-based, of course. Uh, but I will mainly uh, touch here the, the uh, 3D motion uh, synthesis approach. Um, so we started to see, um, um, for example, um, uh, gesture animation, um, also taking into account uh, personality or emotional characteristics um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the people, um, audio-driven animation, um, face former and uh, from uh, Taylor L also, 
um, as well as um, um, generation of um, animation using uh, 3D vertices, uh, scanned, uh, scanned data using a variety of methods uh, from convolutional neural networks to generative adversarial networks to transformers, etc. Uh, another work detects automatically the eye movement uh, given uh, a motion capture uh, body animation and also the recent work is looking into not only single character animation synthesis but generation of animation in two-party or multi-party uh, interactions which is, a, which is an open and active uh, area of uh, research. Okay, so, so far I have been giving some introduction and um, state of the art. Uh, in the next uh, uh, couple of slides I would like to uh, show the work that we have been doing in, in my lab. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm mainly focusing on nonverbal behavior sentences. So I'm interested in social animation, uh, although in general I'm teaching machine learning and deep learning and computer animation for other tasks as well, such as uh, uh, locomotion. Uh, but my, my, my main interest is socially interactive characters. So if you look at nonverbal behaviors, this is a topic that is of interest to different uh, communities. Um, a social signal processing community is, um, is working on this, on this area mainly, uh, but also it is subject to interest in, in uh, virtual worlds uh, and, uh, and animation. Um, and of course, the, the communication and interaction with, between these communities is very, very fruitful. Um, the first work I would like to mention is audio-driven uh, emotion uh, sentences. So this, this was a work um, uh, we, uh, we have done in our uh, group uh, to generate lip-synchronized animation uh, that is uh, detecting also the emotional uh, state in the, in the audio. Um, the, the main goal was to uh, create a, a system that is controllable, so that's because we went for a procedural approach. Uh, and naturalness of the animations was also uh, desired, so we were pushing this, this, uh, this direction as well. Um, here we can see an overall architecture, so um, this system is taking an uh, audio input, we parse the input for, for detecting the phonemes and uh, visems, and we have two components, expressive speech animation and dynamic uh, co-articulation, where we take into account pitch and intensity values in the audio to dynamically uh, change the, 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 um, the intensity of the, the particular visems. So we were creating a kind of a rule base because it's a procedural approach and we generated as a, a Unity uh, plugin and applied it uh, to, to realistic characters. Uh, we made some uh, comparisons to existing um, um, tools. At that time, this is a work from 2019, so at that time we had FaceFX and Rogo Digital uh, commercially available in, in the market. And uh, we indeed find, found out that uh, introduction of the emotional speech animation uh, and finding the emotional cues resulted in better uh, perception of the animation and uh, the users uh, perceived uh, the animation quality uh, better in comparison to FaceFX and, uh, and Robo Digital. Um, we are also working on data-driven facial animation. So, for example, we have been looking into mocap data using generative adversarial networks to find the control space of, of emotion. Um, also, uh, facial retargeting using ra radial basis uh, functions and comparing with, uh, with sequential models such as recurrent neural networks. Um, and we are collecting data in our motion capture lab for facial uh, animation in order to further analyze uh, and generate uh, more convincing animations. Uh, a recent work that we have been doing is, um, is um, uh, FASIX uh, Hubert. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, the, the work is aiming at textless speech-driven expressive uh, 3D facial animation uh, synthesis. Uh, my PhD student, he is also sitting somewhere here, so he's going to, yes, there, <laughs> he's going to present a poster about that uh, tomorrow, so if you want to, to uh, hear more about the details of this work, uh, you can uh, talk to Kazi later. But I will so show a short uh, video here. Uh, what you will see here is, um, uh, the, the first is a neutral face, the second one is an expressive face, and the f last one is showing the difference. Uh, between these two in terms of heat maps so that you can see how uh, which parts of the phase is, is activated. Uh, the method was trained on a, uh, a 3D scan uh, data set uh, uh, with various actors, I think 40, something like that. 
And um, uh, we tested it also with uh, any type of audio, uh, for example, extracted from uh, movies, etc., to see the uh, generative uh, uh, capacities of, of the model. So let's have a look at it. I hope the audio will work. Stuff? Oh, okay, I see. You think this has nothing to do with you. You go to your closet and you select, I don't know, that lumpy blue sweater, for instance, because you're trying to tell the world that you take yourself too seriously to care about what you put on your back, but what you don't know is that... Okay, so that was, uh, sorry, that was uh, Meryl Streep uh, talking <laughs> from Devil Wears Prada. Uh, so we, we tested it with different kind of uh, the, uh, audio to see how, we, how it works. Also singing uh, animation, so there's a full-fledged video you can just go and, and watch. <laughs> uh, it's pretty entertaining. Uh, we were using techniques um, um, such as um, uh, Hubert uh, encoder and, and transformers and um, uh, gated recurrent units to, to generate automatically the facial uh, animation. Um, we were not only working on AI-driven animation generation, but we are also looking into how these animations are, are, are per perceived. Um, this is a study on perception of appearance and uh, animation of virtual characters. Uh, th that was a study that was done by one of my master students. So what we did for this experiment is we created uh, very realistic faces, but also um, uh, low fidelity appearances. We, uh, this is uh, using uh, Unreal Engine MetaHumans. And we also created uh, three levels of animation uh, fidelity. And we were uh, lo creating these conditions and looking uh, at how people are perceiving these animations. Uh, for example, the effect of Uncanny Valley, how eerie the animations are perceived, what is the effect of social presence, uh, etc. So we um, um, simply created some uh, f uh, 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 videos. Um, that are generated in different emotional conditions, such as happy, sad, angry, uh, and neutral. Uh, and we asked the users to rate how natural uh, and believable um, these animations um, are perceived. So, um, what we found, uh, we found that there's a mi the mismatch of motion realism and appearance realism uh, led to significantly higher eeriness. This is a indication of uncanny valet. So if there's a mis mismatch, if you have a very realistic uh, character and an, an, uh, an animation that is not done very properly, um, that will result in, into a disturbing uh, feeling. So if you want to push your application to uh, to a uh, a level that you want to use very realistic characters, you should be really careful uh, about that because uh, uh, if the animations are not matching the appearance, it can be really, really um, uh, disturbing uh, for the people. Um, higher appearance realism led to significantly higher uh, social presence, uh, which was uh, uh, expected. And for full motion realism, higher appearance realism led to significantly higher uh, social presence. Um, there, are a lot, there are a lot of analysis from this st study. I will not really go in, into to, uh, 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 all the details, but I can share with you the, the work for more, uh, more details. Um, what we can conclude uh, from this study is that state-of-the-art photorealistic appearance lends itself better to highly realistic animations than lower appearance uh, realism. So, as, as I mentioned, it's very important to be careful on the, the, this, this match between uh, um, um, uh, high appearance uh, realism and, and animation. If you have a character that is uh, not very realistic, um, you don't maybe need to do very complicated animations uh, for that character or, or vice versa. Um, in addition to facial animation, uh, I have also worked on gaze animation. Uh, this is a work that has been done in collaboration with uh, Guerrilla Games uh, in, in Amsterdam. Uh, they are uh, developing beautiful games such as uh, Horizon uh, Zero Dawn. Um, and um, I had a student working there and uh, uh, Guerrilla Games asked us how we can improve our procedural gaze animation uh, method and come up with something better. Can we try, for example, a data-driven animation approach? So we took the challenge and we collected data uh, in the motion capture lab. Uh, you see an actress here. Um, um, the actress's gaze behavior is captured. So gaze behavior here is defined as the upper body the movement and the actress is following a um, target object in, in, the, in the 3D space. And here, uh, uh, my student, uh, Alex, has this stick, and then at the end of the stick, there is a um, small marker. 
uh, and the, the actors is following that. So it's uh, called the gaze following um, behavior and we would like to replicate this behavior with the virtual uh, characters where the character is following this beer mug. Um, and we were <coughs> using a, um, a, a sequential model, a gated recurrent uh, unit, so the pose and the, um, the, the, the target uh, um, object uh, uh, location is, is given into the network and the network is trained and then the output layer it was generating uh, the, the um, um, rotation values of all the upper body joints there were like uh, 20 plus um, um, joints uh, we also did it for low level of the detail and high level of detail char characters and in, in, in games um, um, and we found out that um, in comparison to the um, procedural approach, uh, we got pretty good results, so as expected, data-driven approach work, work much better. Uh, and we captured the, the situation standing, sitting and laying, so there were three, three different conditions. But as you can see, there are still um, some pr problems in the animation. This is, uh, there, there are moments uh, that is smoothly following the target, but there are moments it's also very jittery, the, the animation, and then it's not really learning the, the, the correct motion. So there's still um, a room for improvement, but it was a promising uh, uh, result to, to show that uh, yeah, gaze animation is also a promising area uh, to pursue uh, in over procedural gaze animation uh, uh, generation. Uh, how am I doing in terms of time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I will try to go a little bit uh, faster. Um, we were also working on uh, expressive gesture animation. So. Uh, in particular in the context of music-driven uh, expressive animation. So uh, we were working with motion capture data that were uh, collected uh, uh, by, by um, uh, piano players, uh, from p piano players, and this, this was a long short-term uh, memory network where we uh, had the musical features and the body position, and in the end we created the upper body position for this character, and we were comparing different metrics in the audio such as pitch, beat, uh, MFCC, etc., to to uh, with with different kind of met metrics such as average position error, acceleration, and jerk, which are representations of smoothness uh, of the of the motion. Uh, I'm going to show a short clip here as well. <laughs> This dark character is the generated motion here, and the pale one, I'm not sure if, if you can see, is the, the ground truth uh, motion. Okay. Um, so, we were also working on nonverbal behavior synthesis in multi party uh, group interactions. Um, that was also a uh, collaboration with a company, uh, Clev VR, in, in, in uh, Delft. Um, and we would like to generate automatically turn-taking behaviors, conversational behaviors for um, for characters that are in the background uh, in, in the game. So the purpose was not to create very realistic motions here, uh, but we were working with uh, um, uh, Carnegie Mellon University Panoptic data set, which is a data set that was captured with depth cameras, and then from this uh, you can extract the skeletons. And then we were analyzing and annotating the turn-taking states and using a, a Bayesian network, so a probabilistic method to automatically generate the, the gestures. Um, and here you can see, for example, there's a red dot. Whenever the character is speaking, you can see how the, the turn-taking is dynamically happening between the characters. Uh, and also the gestures are, are uh, generated. Um, so, in terms of the state of the art uh, and pushing the boundaries of animation synthesis, we are at the stage where we can consider multimodal and multi-party uh, animation. So here you see a video clip that was uh, captured in our motion capture lab. Uh, two students interacting with each other in a, in a um, uh, daily conversation where we captured the whole body, fingers and face all uh, at the same time. Uh, we collected 10 hours of data and now our goal is to, to generate more um, uh, methods uh, taking into account multiple uh, modalities uh, and to see also what is happening in two-party uh, conversations. Um, I will now uh, talk briefly in the remaining part of the talk uh, the interaction uh, topics. Uh, so, so far what I was talking about was the synthesis of, of uh, animations and behaviors, but uh, interact interactive, social interactive virtual characters also started to be become very 
uh, much um, yeah, attracting attention in the in the industry, such as Samsung, Neon, and Nvidia Violet, uh, the company Thole Machines, etc. So we started to see a lot of companies focusing on social interaction. Um, if we look at uh, at a very high level, what is happening in socially uh, interactive uh, characters? The first stage is understanding social and effective cues. The middle stage is decision making and dialogue, and the last part is generating social and effective cues. And if you want to do fully uh, autonomous uh, virtual characters that are socially interactive, we require a quite range of capabilities, expressing and perceiving emotions, communicating with high-level dialogue, dialogue, using natural ways of communication, establishing maintaining social relationships, uh, having a personality, learning recognizing models of others, and learning developing other type of social uh, competencies, for example, walking, uh, following behavior. So this is a list coming from the social robotics community, community but well applies to intelligent uh, uh, virtual characters on, on, uh, on uh, the screen um, uh, as well. But as you can see, these uh, uh, skills are very, very complicated. I often <laughs> joke about that, that you, to, to do such a character, you need the whole computer science department, and it's also not enough. You also need the other, other disciplines, so it's quite a challenging uh, area. Uh, if you pick one of these topics, it's, it's already a, a, a huge. So if you want to go in this direction, be careful what, what part you want to really focus and the feasibility of the things. I can give some tips on that as well on the, on the coffee break if you're interested. Um, so what I have described so far in the first part was only focusing on this uh, last box, generating social and effective cues. But I have been also working some, uh, doing some work in these first two uh, uh, boxes. Um, so I will show some examples of this. This is something that I have been doing um, uh, quite some years back uh, about uh, modeling emotions and memory. So how can we give uh, remembering capabilities um, in an emotional context uh, in social uh, human agent or human robot uh, interaction? Um, this is a fully fledged autonomous system with face recognition, speech recognition capabilities. There's a dialogue manager with a planner and reactive layer. There's episodic memory, which is a special type of memory that uh, stores memories in a, in an over a timeline, so something like autobiographical memory. Uh, and this is interacting with an emotion engine, um, which is updating the emotion and mood of the character in a, in a dynamic way. Um, I was testing this uh, virtual character, and also there's a physical uh, robot from uh, Hanson Robotics uh, here, um, um, in, a, in a teaching scenario. So uh, we tested this system over uh, uh, four weeks, um, uh, two sessions per week, like 20 minute sessions, uh, in a, a teaching scenario with a ge geography teacher. And we would like to, to um, look into what would be the effect of emotion and uh, memory on the um, perception of the quality of the experience, um, measured with social presence and engagement, but also the task uh, performance, so how people were uh, learning and whether it is increasing the learning performance. And we indeed found that the robot uh, condition with emotion and remembering capabilities made people to stick with the conversation longer. The novelty effect didn't disappear immediately and um, it kept the uh, conversation more interesting and, and, and increased the, uh, the, the overall uh, performance. Um, I have been also working on situated interaction, so this is a, a virtual ro uh, receptionist robot that is at the entrance of the computer science building at Utrecht University. Um, the goal of this uh, project was to uh, automatically decide uh, for this character which person to attend to. So it is a basically a situated robot, so you want to see if people are uh, approaching which uh, person is really interested in talking to the robot because they can also be just passing by. So we would like to, to we, we, we looked into uh, several features um, coming from the microphone, uh, microphone array and uh, um, uh, the adapt camera, such as change of di uh, distance, orientation, uh, maybe a greeting, waving hand distance, closeness to the center of field, etc. So all the cues that we can capture, and we created a, a multi-model uh, model of engagement detection. Uh, it, it created an engagement score, and based on this engagement score, uh, the gaze behavior uh, of the robot was autonomously uh, uh, driven. And finally, I also worked on multi-party um, uh, dialogue. Uh, that was a work uh, on uh, social practices theory, 
uh, which is a, um, a social theory. Simply, uh, I can explain it like when you are, we are functioning in a social world, we have certain expectations of uh, other people. For example, if you shake hands uh, with someone, you also expect the other person to shake hands uh, with you. So uh, these kind of constructions you can uh, create. Um, and we created a multi-party dialogue uh, engine. Uh, to um, have these char characters interacting uh, with each other. That was a, a therapy scenario where uh, it's a couple therapy, uh, there are two people and the, the user is, uh, is like a, a, a therapist talking to these characters to manage this, uh, this um, uh, three-party uh, conversation um, as an example. Okay, so uh, I would like to slowly uh, wrap up. Um, so. There are several challenges in this area. The first challenge is because I, I'm uh, always talking about data, data collection. Uh, creating an environment to collect the data, finding the right instruments, actors, actresses, pre-processing, post-processing the data is a quite challenging thing. Uh, it, it, it takes um, quite a, a lot of resources uh, and also, also time. Um, you can consider we can use 2D videos as well, but 2D videos, uh, although they are widely uh, available, it's not uh, at the level of quality at the moment, this 3D construction methods for generating believable and convincing animations. And the second challenge is sophisticated algorithms. Of course, deep learning algorithms are working very well for that, but they are black box algorithms. Uh, you cannot easily uh, debug them, and they might be um, really computationally expensive if you have uh, a lot of data. Um, there is a gap between subjective and objective metrics. So what I mean uh, by that is, for example, if you look at the computer vision community, there are clear benchmarks, so you people are um, comparing to, to each other to, to let's say have 99.2% accuracy so you, you have uh, clear challenges and things like that but in the area of uh, animation it's pretty subjective as well for example if you are generating audio driven gestures uh, there can be multiple different type of gestures um, that are matching with this input uh, audio so uh, comparing only to the object using objective metrics or to the ground truth is not uh, enough and it might even be sometimes contradictory. So uh, in animation research, we always do subjective and objective evaluations uh, together. So we always ask the, the users or experts or animator how they perceive the animation quality. And finally, social signal processing in uh, uh, XR is, a, is, is an interesting area. So how to interpret the social and emotional states of users and how to generate automatic responses. There's quite some work done on social signal processing in human-robot interaction uh, or computer vision, but what are the challenges in particular in, in VR uh, or AR? Is This is uh, still an ongoing uh, area. Uh, in conclusion, uh, virtual humans reach to a state where they can be modeled realistically, but realism in movement and interaction is still missing. Uh, interactive applications requires on the fly generation of animation, so you cannot predefine everything because we, if we are going to have uh, social extended reality, uh, we want these motions to be generated uh, real time on the fly. Um, and perceptual studies are needed to understand what works for which type of applications. So it's not only about generating the motions, but we need to understand what is really working for from the user's uh, point of view, taking a human-centric uh, approach. Um, I would like to thank a lot of my collaborators and, and students over the years. Of course, it was not uh, done, uh, done alone. Um, finally, I want to make two announcements. The first announcement is I was talking about social signal processing in, in XR. We are organizing a workshop in IEEE VR Equip uh, 2023, um, which is uh, on 25th of March, this workshop. So if you are interested in, in that type of uh, research, uh, please, you can still register and participate. And maybe you're already in IEEE VR, so you can, you can drop by. Um, the second uh, announcement is we have an open position available on the area of virtual humans, which is a collaboration between Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics and Utrecht University, uh, deadline March, March 30. So if you are doing a master's and interested in that type of research, please approach me, or if you know someone, please uh, share with them. Okay, so here I'm going to, to show uh, a video, uh, and while it's uh, playing at the background, uh, I think I can accept uh, questions. Thank you very much.
the fastest hand, the fastest tongue. Um, thank you very much for a, uh, a wonderful overview presentation. Um, one of the challenges that people have in the university community of doing data-driven research is that often commercial organizations have much more data and have, have much more processing power and have many more people. Mm -hmm. um, in an area like this, the facial animation, uh, for example, where there's a huge commercial interest in the, in the Disney's, Pixar's, uh, um, with, uh, with massive resources, I would assume, and also a lot of touch-up artists who can, uh, who can correct any, uh, any problems as it goes. Um, uh, if we look at the particular example of gaze tracking, mm -hmm. it seems to me that, that you know, are, there, are there private solutions that have solved this problem already, or is this still an open problem that, that requires public space uh, solutions? And, it, and gaze is just one. There are a whole bunch of these things. You know, how can can we still compete at a university level? Um, you know, I doubt that we can in the machine learning community, but can we do it in in this space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Thank you. Um, so, what is happening uh, in the animation companies, like big animation companies? Um, they have uh, some R&D departments that also focus on that type of research and they publish uh, sometimes. And the community is more going towards uh, publishing data sets and uh, algorithms more, more openly. Um, but it is not really like the in animation industry is super advanced uh, in, in, this, in that area. So there are still missing, uh, missing areas. But that is also true what you say in a sense that, for example, when they are do developing Avatar, they come up with new techniques uh, always uh, for, for facial expression uh, capturing and generation. And all of these things are not always open uh, to, the, to the public. So they, these, these are uh, uh, yeah, uh, protected with commercial <laughs> interests, of course. Um, um, but um, there are also things that industry cannot do or that doesn't have the, the resources or priority uh, to do. And I think these are the things that the research uh, uh, universities uh, can do. Ideally, we should collaborate. <laughs> so that, that's, that is the ideal. We should talk more to, to each other. So this is what I'm trying to do. For example, I, I talk with, uh, with Guerrilla Games, uh, PlayStation, uh, Sony, these kind of people to find out what they are, their needs are and how we can uh, really do things that is uh, also uh, uh, helping for the needs of the, the industry. Okay, and, and one last observation, because I just saw the piano player uh, yeah. behind you. Um, how much of this is, is psychology and how much of this is technology in terms of having convincing avatars? Do you, do you, do you really need to duplicate reality or do you really need to fool people? Um, well, when you are generating expressive uh, animations, um, we always, as I said, compare to ground truth animation. So we try to be as close as possible to the, to the ground truth. But uh, the animations generated can be various, so it can be, uh, deviate from the... Uh, it, it, you, it, it's better to use generative methods, like more probabilistic methods, so you can get some sort of variation and not, not so, some sort of repetition. So in, in that sense, you have, you have some... Uh, room for both objective and sub subjective metrics. So there's not like re really a lot of benchmarking uh, yet going on in this area. But we, um, uh, two years ago, we started a, a, a challenge, a Genea challenge, uh, which is a, a, a work that is uh, aiming to benchmark gesture generation methods that are generated by different groups. So we can really do these comparisons. But there has to be a lot of talking and comparisons and benchmarking uh, for this type of uh, research, which is not really happening because it originally it's coming from the computer graphics animation domain, mm -hmm. uh, which was initiated by industry. And it was like, let's do something that works for this uh, for particular scenario uh, and push the boundaries. And then yeah, if, if it is satisfying for the, the, the animators, it is good. But from a scientific point of view, we need more benchmarking and evaluation and comparison. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, 
Um, I want to ask a technical question about the gaze uh, tracking one. And how did you, uh, what device did you use to collect the data? Can it also collect data like the, uh, for example, the pupil, um, like the diameter, mm -hmm. this kind of? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we were um, uh, collecting data both from uh, upper body, so um, the, the movement of the torso, uh, as well as the, the head, head movement and also eyeball movements. Uh, we fed uh, eyeball movements into the, uh, into the network as well, but the, that one was not producing very, very good re results, so we were mostly focusing on the head generation and the body movement uh, generation. But we have the data, so it, it can be um, yeah, more, more ex uh, elaborated on, on that part uh, as well. Uh, what, what, can I ask uh, one more last question? Sure. Also about this project, um, do, do you think uh, also the pupil dilation and um, uh, for example the scan, the saccade, mm -hmm. uh, this kind of uh, data is also important for uh, virtual human? Yeah, definitely. That was a gaze following behavior, but you can also have a saccadic behavior like mm -hmm. jumping uh, uh, on dif different type of objects. Uh, we actually um, uh, created a setup uh, to collect uh, saccadic data as well. We put in the motion capture system a lot of ca cables and uh, uh, buzzers <laughs> that, 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 that make noises and, and uh, so that we can um, um, capture this, this data. Uh, it was quite challenging because um, when there's sound, people are not very accurate about uh, directing their gaze to, to the sound. So they, they, the sound is coming from here, but maybe they look, look there. So we have to find another way uh, to collect more robust uh, saccadic data rather than only using uh, audio, maybe um, something like a, a colorful objects and maybe a little bit training in advance the, 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 the users. So that is uh, something still to be explored. But if you have any ideas, suggestions, happy to talk further. Thank you. Hi. So first, thanks for this great uh, overview. Um, yesterday, we saw some demonstrations in the lab of uh, CWI on uh, volumetric capture approaches for representing real humans. Do you see some of those approaches on the one hand volumetric capture and on the other hand animation coming together in certain, uh, certain applications or directions? Can you uh, reflect on that? Yeah, definitely, yes. Uh, I think uh, social XR is, <laughs> is a very obvious application area uh, for that. Um, so if we can have, for example, audio-driven characters um, that are representations of ourselves, right, over, over a distance, um, maybe we don't want to show our face all the time and we can drive these this avatars directly with audio and text. So my camera is not turned on or whatever capturing device, I just talk to, to a microphone and my avatar kind of talks. So it's, it's in, the, in, the, in the range of deep fakes. <laughs> Sort of, um, so but in, done in 3D and, and 4D. Um, but of course, there will be also some ethical considerations uh, there if you have these digital copies of uh, ourselves, which is a very very important topic. I think. Or but in device, I just talked to and a and microphone. microphone. Um, um, but of course, there will be also some ethical. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird to hear your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to charge these or should I just leave it on the desk? No, just leave, just leave it. Um, yeah. Is there anything after lunch? Yes. Yeah. Right. changed. Oh, it's, oh, yeah. Because I have this schedule saying yeah. I go back to 016, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. Or not.
we have I, I need to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't know you, the answer. I'll, I'll, I would I'll, think you guys know better than me. <laughs> uh, no, maybe they do. I'll check with them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Let's just get yeah. this here. <laughs> I thought this this was it for this room. For this room, okay. Yeah. And the other one will happen back in that. Yeah. Room? Oh, the remote speaker, right? Yeah, I didn't know. Just like yesterday. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, actually, you're right. Ah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, recently, it was a bit messy. Yeah, it was a bit messy.